Consensus is immensely dangerous in science. Very serious. Very dangerous. That is not how science progresses. Science progresses through critical falsification. And the moment we are not open to that, science, I think, is dangerous. I couldn't agree with you more, Philip. Except the fact that we're all, we are approximating towards a better understanding where we're heading. Where we are now is better than where we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Even within paradigm shifts, we do have that. I mean, you've got to acknowledge that. Well, the trouble, yes, models are weak in terms of falsification. Because they can only really be tested against historical contingencies and future measurements. That's one of the big, big problems. So if you're basing things on models, whatever it is, from economics, he says, with a weak moment, to, 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 to climate change, models have an inherent weakness in terms of this. That is, of course, the great problem of predicating policy on science, however much it seems to have a consensus. Well, that's where we're going to leave it for today, I'm afraid. My thanks to Carolyn Crawford, S. Anderson, and Philip Sott. Next week, we're going to be back in the studio with the ornithologist Graham Appleton and geographer Sue Buckingham. As always, please do let us know any questions you might have for them. It just remains for me to thank our hosts and audience today here at the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge. The idea of consensus, because I think it's, it's, it's a critical issue that you've raised. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 experts, they're not there to hide things, they're not there to hide the truth. They're always, admittedly, there are of course errors that they can make, but by and large, you can't ignore a consensus of all the world's experts. I wouldn't myself want to live in a world where, you know, that kind of expertise is ignored. Yeah, I must disagree with you. So all, please remember that 95% of scientists in the early part of the 20th century believed in eugenics. Consensus is immensely dangerous in science. Very serious about that. Very dangerous. That is not how science progresses. Science progresses through critical falsification. But the answer differs according to which image you look at. There are some that are in what we call false colour. So it's not the true colours. They've been so exaggerated or emphasised but according to which image you look at. There are some that are in what we call false colour. So it's not the true colours, they have been some exaggerated or emphasised colours because they want to make sort of the pictures that you might see that are used for publicity purposes have all been colourised to be almost natural. The idea being it's what you would see if you could fly there and look at it with your own eyes. So in general, they try and make them natural colours, but you do have to watch out for the odd false colour one. I just wanted to say, I think they are certainly some of the most iconic images uh, of our time. And I think one reason why that is, is they are actually free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> so they're available for people like myself who work in uh, you know, magazines and in the media, uh, and also for you know, everyone else out there, and along with that continuum. Now, for our last question today, we're going to turn to a discussion that's been bubbling along in Home Planet for quite some time. It comes from Mike French and features another aspect of the complex science of atmospheric carbon dioxide. When he first heard about CO2 and climate change, he was convinced by the connection, but he's become increasingly sceptical because of the failure to demonstrate how the relationship might work. Mike, can you explain? Like many people, I've been an anxious follower of the global climate change debate. We're told it's caused by man-made carbon dioxide. But the main great the Earth, where it's trapped by a bucket of gases, um, if carbon dioxide and methane are like a blanket, then water vapour is like a duvet. It's such a simple concept, and it should be a straightforward matter to investigate. An insulated tank, a heater, some ejected gases, and perhaps a recording thermometer. But we're several years on now, and I've still not seen anything like that. So my question is this, why haven't we seen any real physical models created to validate the concept? Has anyone actually tried to produce one? And if not, why not? Also, one of the phrases we keep hearing in this context is the consensus of opinion. Is In fact, I think we've heard it here tonight. But consensus is not a science. And presumably you are talking about what we commonly know as the greenhouse effect, I suppose. Well, Philip, why no good laboratory experiment demonstrating, say, the carbon dioxide acts as a greenhouse gas? There have been attempts at physical models for part of atmospheric processes. Very recently, for example, the Danish researchers carried out some very good work on cosmic rays and cloud formation, actually, the laboratory physical analysis. But I think the answer is that if we tried to model the whole of the atmosphere in the way that you write put forward, it would actually make the Large Hadron Collider look a little bit like a Meccano set. Uh, 
In other words, it is an enormously complex and difficult task. But I'm so glad you asked this question, because behind it, there is a false analogy. The idea that the Earth's atmosphere functions like a greenhouse is just wrong, full stop. And everybody has known it for quite a long time. Let me just bring this in. Your solar radiation comes into your greenhouse. It does indeed pass through the glass. It warms up your plants. It warms up your soil. It warms up your pathways in your greenhouse. The only key reason why that then remains is because your greenhouse is a closed system, which then prevents free convectivity, free convection. That is an absolutely false analogy for how the atmosphere works. Because convection is central to that. Absolutely, Richard. The Earth is the Earth's atmosphere is a radiative, convective system. Yes, sir. Let's bring you in here. Yeah, we persist with it. We do. Um, uh, I want to take Philip's uh, place as Home Planet's resident historian, just for the purposes of this <laughs> question. Um, by, uh, when, when I saw this question come in, I have a, I have a book which I occasionally refer to in my work, and it's called Favourite Experiments in Schooling College Science, and it's published about 15 years ago. And I thought that, well, if there's been a laboratory experiment, and if it's replicable and fairly straightforward, it ought to be in this book, and lo and behold, I think it's on page 57, it's there. And it dates back to 1909, when this experiment was first done. And the idea is actually quite straightforward, where um, uh, a, a, U a US uh, scientist called Roberts. He, what he first did was that he uh, created two greenhouses, uh, two, two greenhouses, one using glass and the other one using salt crystals. The idea being that salt is completely transparent to infrared, so there shouldn't be a warming inside the salt greenhouse, whereas you should find one inside the glass. And what he found was that there was a negligible difference in the temperature between the two, and from that he concluded that what well, maybe greenhouse is a greater way to description. Nowadays, Philip, um, you know, okay, okay, co colleagues of yours use the phrase atmospheric effect, I think it's a better way of putting it. But I think the deep question, as a science scientist, and I have a lot of scientists with us tonight, what is our attitude morally to the use of models which we actually know to be wrong? Can I come back to my point? One of the points that you raised, that you raised uh, earlier, which is about the idea of consensus, because I think it's, 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 a, it's a critical issue that you've raised. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 experts, they're not there to hide things, they're not there to hide the truth. They're always, admittedly, there are of course errors that they can make, but by and large, you can't ignore a consensus of all the world's experts. I wouldn't myself want to live in a world where, you know, that kind of expertise is ignored. Yeah, I must disagree with you, Nelson. All, please remember that 95% of scientists in the early part of the 20th century believed in eugenics. Consensus is immensely dangerous in science. I'm very serious about that. Very dangerous. That is not how science progresses. Science progresses through critical falsification and through paradigm shifts. At the moment, we are not open to that. Science, I think, is open. I couldn't agree with you more, Philip, except the fact that we're all, we are approximating towards a better understanding where we're heading. Where we are now is better than where we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Even within paradigm shifts, we do have that. I think yeah, but, sure. but the trouble, yes, models are weak in terms of falsification because they can only really be tested against historical contingencies and future measurements. That's one of the big, big problems. So if you're basing things on models, whatever it is, uh, from economics, he says, with a weak moment to, 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 to climate change, Models have an inherent weakness in terms of this. That is, of course, the great problem of predicating policy of science, however much it seems to have a consensus. Can I remind you with that? Well, that's where we're going to leave it for today, I'm afraid. My thanks to Caroline Crawford, Essan Massoud, and Philip Stott. Next week, we're going to be back in the studio with the ornithologist Graham Appleton and geographer Sue Buckingham. As always, please do let us know any questions you might have for them. It just remains for me to thank our hosts and audience today here at the Institute